Hello, I'm Robert Costa, and this is the Washington Week Extra, where we pick up online where we left off on the broadcast. Joining me around the table, Shauna Thomas of Vice News, Mark Mazzetti of the New York Times, Andrea Mitchell of NBC News, and John Decker of Fox News Radio. California and New York are now suing President Trump over a new question on the upcoming 2020 census. Are you a citizen, it asks, and 12 other states may follow suit. Critics argue this question has wide-ranging detrimental consequences. When you think about the census controversy, what does it reveal about the Trump administration and its agenda with this particular project? Well, number one, they're, they're saying basically that in one version of the census, which is the American Community Survey, which they do every year, but they do it for a smaller amount of the population and they use algorithms basically to widen it out, they do ask a citizenship question. So what's the big deal to a certain extent? Um, the problem with this is that one, even though we've been talking about this citizenship census question for a little while, um, you know, Com Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross uh, insisted that it be put in almost under the deadline for making questions for the census. Number two is, even if it's for perfectly logical reasons, I think the Justice Department has said it has to do with enforcing the Voting Rights Act, um, it doesn't matter because it now looks political. When you are working with an administration that um, is, has approached immigration the way it is, has approached trying to deport people the way it has, people are going to look at this and they're going to tie it to that. And even if you try to break those things apart, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. And so it is going to offend some people and other people are going to defend it and it just gets thrown into this political thing that the census isn't really supposed to be. And it will, it will, it will depress participation. And that's a big problem because we need the census to be accurate, not only for congressional districts and the like. We need the census to be accurate for the CDC, for communicable, communicable diseases, for all kinds of health reasons, we need to know these facts. And if fewer people participate or are afraid to participate, you're not going to have accurate data. But this is why California, New York, and, and other states, Massachusetts, Ohio, uh, say that they will join uh, with lawsuits against the administration, just the political uh, aspect of it. And that is, they fear that with uh, an undercount in their particular states, they may lose uh, seats in the, in the House of Representatives, which is a major concern to California, which has large representation, the largest in the country, and New York State as well. And so although the plan is for this particular question to be on the census in 2020, uh, I don't know whether it will be because it's going to be tied up in the courts for some time before the census actually goes out to every citizen in this country. Let's turn to foreign policy. Defense Secretary James Mattis welcomed incoming National Security Advisor John Bolton at the Pentagon for their first meeting on Thursday. We talked about that during the show and that exchange. The two, though, will now need to work closely on a number of issues, which many, which, which on some fronts, the men do defer dramatically, including on the upcoming summit, the proposed summit with North Korea. Mattis has said he's a firm believer in diplomacy. Bolton has long been, of course, a hardliner who advocates for a preliminary strike and regime change in North Korea. This week was interesting because China confirmed North Korean uh, leader Kim Jong-un traveled to Beijing to meet with the Chinese president, Xi Jinping. Some experts believe China is reasserting its dominance in the region ahead of these talks between President Trump and Kim and five other countries in the region. Andrea. What to make of all of this? We have, as we were talking about in the show, a new dynamic on national security, Pompeo perhaps at state, Bolton in the White House, the president. But there's also regional uh, positioning going on in, in, in Asia. Well, first of all, you've got China very nervous about this new North and South Korea uh, detente, if you will, the beginnings of, of movement, um, you know, a meeting between them at the end of April already and also nervous about the U.S. role. And so they wanted to make sure that they welcomed Kim Jong-un to his first, what we believe to be his first foreign trip, done in great secrecy, uh, with red carpet welcome and the, uh, the full state visit treatment to show that they're in charge in their own neighborhood. Uh, they very much want to also be coordinating and in part of this conversation. Uh, that said, the Bolton factor is going to be a major potential disruption. And Pompeo is already, as CIA director, doing a lot of the advance work. We don't have a secretary of state. 
And so he is filling that role. And he's also been very hard line, even talked hypothetically about regime change in North Korea back in the, at the Aspen Security Conference last summer. So there's a mismatch between the president's somewhat idealistic views of how he can exert personal diplomacy through his personality on this young man, uh, who has been underestimated, I think, by American intelligence, and the realistic approach and hardline approach, I think, by John Bolton and Pompeo, who are preparing the summit. What was the message from the Chinese to Kim? The message to Kim is that denuclearization is, you know, the important fact that he has to stick to. But what, how does he define denuclearization? Is he talking about the Americans withdrawing their nuclear umbrella from our allies there? Uh, so these are the kinds of details. The real risk here is that the president agreed to this spontaneously, <laughs> surprising the South Koreans before he'd even been briefed on the details. And is, are his expectations too high? If it disappoints him, if both sides leave disappointed, the only fallback option is military. I'm an optimist by nature. I'd love to see a diplomatic solution uh, to what has uh, really troubled many administrations, but I'm also a realist. And the fact of the matter is, is that Kim Jong-un, since this was announced several weeks ago at the White House by South Korea's National Security Advisor, has not uh, announced to its own people, people, North Korea has not announced to its own people, this possibility of a meeting with President Trump, this possibility of denuclearizing, which would be just against everything that country stands for. This is something that gives them strength, it gives them power, it puts them on equal footing with other superpowers around the world. And to give that up, I just don't see happening. I'm, I'm an optimist that a meeting can happen, uh, but I'm a realist. I don't think much is going to happen if that meeting happens. It's interesting. You read about China and how they're pulling back on some of their uh, their trade with, with North Korea, and that's maybe brought them to the table a little bit. Uh, of course, there are other factors. Uh, but w when you think about the, the conditions that Bolton could set, anything come to mind? Is it, I mean, he's the longtime hardliner. Right, and he's going to have the president's ear, and so it, it's interesting he comes in at this moment right after Trump, as Andrea said, surprised everyone with this, and now enter John Bolton, who has, you know, decades of thinking about this issue, and what is going to be the interplay between especially Bolton, Madison, Pompeo, and and who kind of the war for the president's mind over this issue, and, and uh, in a, you know, it's we're, we're coming up to the moment. Uh, and so um, I think, you know, we kind of know where John Bolton stands. The question is whether he's going to sort of change his position at all. Let's talk about the Russia probe and, and stick with you, Mark, and your reporting, because pr President Trump's former campaign manager, Paul Manafort, and his deputy at that time, Rick Gates, they were in contact with a business associate known to have ties to Russian military intelligence during the 2016 presidential campaign. According to court documents filed this week by Special Prosecutor Bob Mueller, Gates has admitted knowing that the associate was a former officer with Russian military intelligence, the GRU. How significant is this story? Well, in a way, um, you know, the headline that uh, Trump campaign advisors had contact with Russian intelligence doesn't really shock anymore. I mean, we've had now multiple cases where this is this this has happened, but it's significant for a few reasons. First of all, um, you know, Manafort has long said that this former associate, Konstantin Kalimnik, he didn't know whether he was a Russian intelligence officer or had any Russian intel background. But Mueller's document comes out and says, uh, in fact, that Gates knew and told others that he had been with the GRU and that they were doing this, you know weeks before the election, so September, October of 2016. The other interesting thing that comes in the document is that Mueller says directly, this, these conversations are, quote, relevant to the investigation. Um, and the person who he was charged in sentencing in that document had withheld that information. So with Mueller, you're always reading between the lines. You have to look at the public statements, the documents. But it is interesting that Kalimnik um, and the role uh, of these conversations is brought out by Mueller. And one other point, um, Manafort has long said that his case is a sideshow, right? Whatever they were going after him and Gates for, it doesn't matter. It doesn't uh, affect the Russian collusion question, the question of Russian interference. Well, this kind of brings the two a little bit together more than has been in the past. And Manafort's going to trial. Right. He's going to trial. Fighting. Gates has cut a deal. Manafort's continuing to fight. And we just keep hearing about Rick Gates. I mean, we, we were talking during the show about John Dowd having conversations uh, with Gates and, and Manafort. And was it with Gates? Was it with Manafort Gates' attorney? Manafort and Flynn. Manafort and Flynn. Manafort and Flynn. Manafort Flynn. Manafort Flynn. But Dowd never talked. Did Dowd ever talk to Gates' attorney? Uh, not that we know of. Okay. Yeah.
But is the White House, the administration, based, based on your conversations with sources, is are they alarmed about Rick Gates and how he continues to work with the Mueller investigation? I mean, I think they're alarmed about everything that Mueller keeps bringing out about Rick Gates. I mean, we talked about this filing this week. Um, it, there's no way to not be alarmed, basically because of what you said, because we, now we are inching closer and closer to whatever Mueller is trying to do with Manafort and everything that he's found about his businesses. Clearly, there may have been a deal to be made somehow. Manafort's not making that deal, but something else is there. And that's the thing, is every time there's a new filing, every time something hits our inboxes and we're all like, whoa, what is happening? There's something else there. And Gates lasted on the campaign a lot longer than Manafort exactly. did. Well, he was and, there and, at the And time, into the, and like, in, and into the year, Manafort. the first year of the White House. Yeah. Right? Well, and big... that Mueller filing was the most fascinating because it yeah. was explicit. It said, this is what we are looking at, and it was a big deal. The other thing that uh, there's been some reporting on this week is that there, Mueller is also looking at the way the platform at the Republican National Committee was changed, was altered to favor uh, the Ukrainian, in, Russian Ukrainian influences and to uh, satisfy Manafort's, uh, Manafort's client. And who was running the convention for the Trump campaign at the time? It was Paul Manafort, right? But with, with all Rick of Gates at his and, side. with Rick Gates at his side, and he side. also had to leave right after that. That's right. Yeah. Well, with all of this, though, all of these stories that have come out, we mentioned Rick Gates and we mentioned Paul Manafort. But where does Donald J. Trump fit into the picture? To what extent does he know about what they are doing, uh, perhaps behind closed doors and perhaps behind his back? That's the real key here, because we already know that these two individuals mm -hmm. are, you know, in the in, in the crosshairs of uh, the special counsel's office. That's why one of them uh, has already cut a deal, and the other one has said, I'm not cutting a deal, I'm going to go to trial, perhaps because he's the means to do so, and perhaps, uh, getting back to our conversation earlier, he's banking on a presidential pardon. That's a crucial point. So often when you talk to witnesses or lawyers familiar with the case, it's about what was the extent of the candidate, now president's, knowledge of Manafort and all of his activities, and Rick Gates and all of his activities, and then it comes down to intent mm -hmm. when he was president with all of these different decisions he made. With the, uh, there has been potential obstruction of justice alleged intent and then knowledge. We're going to keep an eye on all of it, but that's it for this edition of the Washington Week Extra. While you're online, take our Washington Weekly quiz. And read my take on President Jimmy Carter, who just published his 32nd book at age 93. I hope. We can all be that productive at age 93. I'm Robert Costa. Thanks for watching.